Welcome. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. At the beginning of this chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. In this passage, Jesus equips his disciples with something they could not get from the law. With the law of Moses in hand, the apostles already had an advantage, a sort of head start. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 3, it's a great advantage to know the commandments that were revealed by God to Moses and the prophets. If you have the law, and you have faith that it comes from God, and you think it through, and you have the means to diagnose the problem of sin, you can see that none of us measures up to God's standard. As Isaiah 64, 6 says, All our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. When we consider the commandments that God gave to Moses and the prophets and what God has handed down from them to us, we can tell others about the spiritual diagnosis that the great physician gave to the church at Laodicea. You think that you're rich and wealthy and self-sufficient, but you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. There's a reason why the first sentence of the first sermon that Jesus preached in the Gospel of Matthew is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who know that they are not rich in spirit. Blessed are those who know that they are in debt to God. If a person is unaware that he has a debt, he won't make an effort to get it paid off. If a person is unaware that he is sick, he won't look for a cure. Now, one of the reasons that most of us are hunkered down in our homes is that currently there's no easy way to tell a healthy person from a person who has the coronavirus but hasn't got any symptoms yet. A person might say, I feel fine, I have no fever, I have no cough. And he might be tempted to do one of those things that we're being told not to do. But in doing so, he might be spreading the virus and not realize it because he hasn't had an adequate examination. Well, what applies on the physical level also applies spiritually. As long as we avoid examining our lives, it might not dawn on us that we're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Until, until the light shines upon us, we might not see that we've been stuck in darkness. Until we hear Jesus call, Lazarus, come forth, we won't realize that we're dead in the tomb. Not a little bit dead, but four days dead. We need new life, and the source of that new life is not in us. The source of new life is God. That's why the poor in spirit are blessed. They know the extent of their debt. They know that it's something beyond their power to pay. They know that their only hope is to fall at the feet of the person who gave them all the things that they've squandered and ask for mercy. The disciples were entrusted with the task of sharing this news. They had the honor and the responsibility of letting people know that they're in debt to God and that their debt's been paid by the Son of God and that the Father is ready and willing to declare their spiritual debt forgiven and that the gift of the Holy Spirit is promised for those who repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so they may rise and walk in the newness of life. With that task set before them, the words of Christ in verse 2 were probably a little puzzling at first. You're going to be expelled from the synagogues. Those rabbis you admired years ago, they're going to throw you out. You will be rejected, and the gospel will be rejected, and whoever kills you will say to himself, That's my good deed for the day. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. But after promising his disciples that some of them would seem to lose the way the world counts wins and losses, Jesus gave his disciples consolation in two parts. First, he told them that when you're persecuted, your persecutors are just showing you who they are. They're demonstrating that they don't know the Father, and they don't know the Son. They might think they know, just as a sick person can convince himself that he is healthy, just as a poor debtor can tell himself he's not really in debt. But that's part of the problem. When a person's infected with sin, vision is the first thing to go. Sin obscures the ability to see one's own sin for what it is. The first symptom of sin is denial. It's not so bad, or that's normal, or it's just a flesh wound. 
But those denials cannot excuse the fact that a persecutor has become a persecutor. There's a reason why, when Jesus called the Pharisees fools, he also called them blind. Second, Jesus said in verse 4, These things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you about them. And this statement of Christ has a scope that applies not only to the persecution that the apostles experienced, but to all of the difficulties that the body of Christ has endured, including what we're experiencing right now. When things happen that surprise us, God is not surprised. And in another passage, Jesus told his disciples, there will be false prophets, there will be wars, there will be rumors of war, there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And he assured his disciples that none of these things is a surprise to God. None of these things should cause anyone to imagine that God has stepped away and given his throne over to a false prophet, or to a political ruler, or to a military leader, or to a natural disaster, or to a disease. Jesus gave assurance to his disciples, and he gives assurance to us. So that if we're like Peter in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, starting to panic because of the storm, Jesus says, I know. Remember, I already told you. He doesn't say exactly how he'll resolve every situation we face. But the more we know him, the more we trust him to make us more than conquerors. Do we face death? Christ has already conquered death. Nothing in all of creation, nothing in the past, nothing in the future, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is why we can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Those words from Romans 8.31 have been a comfort to many believers. Excavators have found this quotation written on the doors of quite a few ancient building, buildings. If we face death, we know that death will not separate us from God. If we face something else, we know that that will not separate us from God's love. Whether it's persecution, or distress, or peril, or isolation. We've been strongly encouraged by the government to physically isolate ourselves during this pandemic, and understand, understandably so, but spiritually, we're not isolated from each other. Spiritually, we are one body, connected by one spirit. I encourage you to treat this time of physical isolation as an opportunity for spiritual growth. Like soldiers in a fortress and during a siege, they're not idle, they're exercising. So exercise with the sword of the spirit. Redeem this time by using it in the study of God's word. Redeem this time in prayer for all people, especially those in positions of authority. Use this time to exercise patience and spiritual discipline so that each one of us who comes out of this pandemic will be spiritually stronger than we were when we started. And use this time to examine yourselves. With that in mind, we come to the Lord's table. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our lives are in your hands. You know our thoughts. You know our fears. But help us to also know your promises. Bring them to mind as we now consider the things that your Son did on our behalf. We consider his broken body. We think about his shed blood. We think about the price with which we were purchased for your kingdom. Lord, help us to be our focus. Help us to be our confidence. Through your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the, new co is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in the remembrance of me.
The service is now concluded. May the joy of the Lord be your strength.